You know, I find it interesting that most plants, when you move them inside, they tend to not always throw a fit, but, you know, the growth just slows down. Things always do better outdoors. This one popped out three new leaves in, like, two and a half weeks. Definitely did not have this sitting in a spot where it was getting enough light during the summertime, did I? Oops. Well, this is how we learn. I'll put in a spot with more light next year. Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I am great. It's an absolutely beautiful day outside. That was a lot of movement there. Sorry. Usually like to have the camera leveled out before I start talking. Got carried away there. In last weekend's vlog, I had mentioned that I did still have some perennials left to go in the ground, but I decided to wait just one more week because the forecast was so much better for this week than last week. It was like 30s and 40s last week, lots of gloom and just wet and blech. When I was looking at the forecast last week, I saw that it was supposed to be in the 60s and 70s. This week, that seems like a more logical time to be planting stuff outside. You wanna go out? I know you do, you always wanna go out. Oh, just in time for an airplane. Wonderful. Beautiful out. It's like 73, a little bit sticky. The air's fresh and just magnificent. Magnificent? <laughs> magnificent. Clearly we've had some cold. Plenty of colds going through. We found a seashell. That's fun. Even though it's like, I think I said 72. Might be 73 right now. The low tonight's like 31. It's going to be in the 60s tomorrow with a low of like 29. So we're just bouncing all over the place this time of year. Which is to be expected. Pool's all shut down. There's no reason to have it running anymore. Like the water's too cold. It costs a fortune to run the heater this time of year. So just cover it up. I do miss the sound of the water, but that's all right. I don't spend a ton of time out here this time of year anyway. So it doesn't matter. I have been going through and very slowly pulling up some of the annuals. Like the sun and patience still looked okay until a few days ago. Well, at least these did right here. Clearly not so much now. They're not looking too hot anymore. So those can go. I don't usually worry about getting them out with the roots and everything. In fact, I think there were only three left. It was just the three right here that were still hanging on. I'd already pulled up the rest of them. Look, there's even still some tiny little growths down in there. They're trying to hold on, but it's just no point. Growing season is over. Last one, got the roots on those last two. It is stinky over here. It's the lantana, that's what that is. Got a nice little pile of annuals here to get cut up and either thrown into a pile or taken out with the yard waste. As far as the planting's concerned, you know, I chose to come out here when it looked like it was overcast, but that didn't work out very well, did it? Gotta go with it. Those are the joys of filming outside. This year, I mostly just wanted to plant daffodils. I love daffodils. They tend to be more long-lived, less maintenance. You know, tulips, you throw them in the ground. Sometimes they do well, sometimes they don't. Never really know how long they're going to last. And with the way our springs are, you just, you never even know what they're going to do for you. you I planted tons of tulips last year, which I shouldn't have done. I should know better by now. And then they got up, got budded, and then it snowed on them. Cause that's how the weather is here. Y'all you, just heard me talking about it, right? 73 right now, 31 tonight. Just never know what's going to be happening. And the tulips tend to throw a fit with that hyacinth. They do find crocus, they don't care. And um, daffodils. Daffodils are fine. Oh, and the snow, the, what are they, the snowdrop things? Those are usually pretty sturdy. But the tulips, they always go downhill when those cold snaps come through, if they come through. Sometimes they don't. Last year was pretty extreme. So in here, I have three of the Beauregard alliums, which is just a nice big tall allium, 36 to 50 inches high. 50 inches, that seems like that's probably an exaggeration, but I don't know. They have a lilac pink flower on them instead of just a dark purple one that gets about 10 inches in diameter and they last three weeks. I have three of those. I was trying to plant the, or wanted to plant the Globe Masters, but I couldn't find those anywhere. So just went with the Beauregards, those are fine. And then five of the pink parasol daffodils, 14 to 16 inch height. With these, I believe the outside of these is like a nice soft white and then the inner part, the coronas, should be like an apricot. Apricot or pink, wait, does it actually? Oh, it says exactly right here. Yes, apricot pink. It says what they are in the bag. That's nice. That's really nice because so much time passes between placing a bulb order and actually receiving them that oftentimes I forget what I've even ordered. It's nice having the description right there. Mount Hood daffodils. I've wanted these for a long time and just, they always fell to the bottom of my list and I never order them. It's just a really big daffodil, 16 to 18 inches tall with giant white creamy yellow cups, which soon changes to pure white. They just have really big flowers on them. 
So that's why I wanted them. It's just a really big, dramatic daffodil. <laughs> and all that's left in here is a, just a great big bag of assorted daffodils. This is the three months of mixed daffodils. This mixture consists of many different types of daffodils, ensuring three months of flowering will increase year after year. Yeah, because they multiply. So the whole reason I wanted those was just because they're really, there's just too many to choose from. And with daffodils and tulips, you have your early, your middle and late bloomers. So early spring, mid spring, late spring. And when I saw that there was a mix, I think it was on sale. I can't remember. I was like, you know, I just took all the other stuff out of the cart except for the allium and then those two other daffodils and said, you know, I'm just going to do that. That's fine. Because when it comes to the daffodils, I just like to plant them in chunks and sort of let them naturalize. I'm not looking to like necessarily landscape with them. Does that make sense? Uh, hopefully it does. Go ahead and get this box loaded back up. Got my bulb auger here and get these in the ground. Goodness, y'all, I just dropped my camera. I only dropped it like an inch, but that's still, that still freaks me out. Trying out my old tripod here, the one that broke last year. If you watched last week's vlog, then you remember me showing my, my new tripod's broken, so back to using this one. First things that I want to plant up are the Beauregard alliums. I want them back here in this garden bed because they bloom late spring, early summer, according to the website. Really typical allium blooming time, but I wanted that pinkish and purple, those big balls of flowers up here. I think that would look nice. In this area, I usually put some sun in patience and you know, you just saw me rip them up, which they're definitely not going to get tall enough to block the alliums, but they could get tall enough to block the foliage. However, I don't think that that's going to be too much of a problem timing wise because well, the alliums should be blooming right around the time the sun and patients are maybe just a foot or so tall. So I think that they'll blend well together. And that's if I even do sun and patients here again next year. I don't know. I always try and mix it up. Well, not really. I should try and mix it up. That's what I meant to say. This isn't even supposed to be here. This is a bikini teeny colocasia and they spread all over the place. Not using any bulb tone or anything like that, just plopping these down in the ground. That looks like the biggest chunk of garlic ever, which makes sense because it's an allium. I know that that seems shallow. They should go six inches down. Bed got kind of washed out this year. It's usually an inch or so higher. It's all on a slope. It's hard to show depth and angles on camera, but I have to build this back up next year. I'm gonna be putting more soil in. About another two inches probably as long as they're about three or four inches down that should be good i always get conflicted about showing the bulb planting on the channel because you know there's not really much to see just a bunch of soil uh, i don't know if i need to talk about this but flat end down pointy end up this bulb stuff i did plant them a smidge close to well not really they're at 18 to 24 inches apart that should be fine all right over here in this corner this the really has got to go. It's been nice. It did pretty well out here. The spot didn't get quite enough light for it. I need my sniffers. As far as this area being sheltered enough for it, this was a great location. I do think that this could potentially return next year, but I don't know for sure. And that would be fine and great. If it does come back next year, I'll just dig it up and move it to another spot. The problem with this location for it was that it just, I didn't get the right kind of light. It bloomed, but not as heavily as it really should have. So this would do better in a spot really where it gets morning and afternoon sun. But right here pretty much was just getting late morning and afternoon sun. These gingers up here, those eventually come midsummer. They're tall enough that they shade them pretty heavily. Hence why they were all swooped forward like that. But this corner here, it's, you just gotta go with me <laughs> on this. So. Not much to see here during the springtime. It's just, you know, a couple of tiny little sable miners. Maybe the gingers just barely peeking out of the soil and uh, those ostrich ferns. That's like the main appeal of this area. So I thought this would be a great spot for some daffodils. You have the fun little cute spring flowers there. Two varieties I'm going to put here are ones that will flower mid spring. So come time to plant the annuals won't be a problem. I have to make sure they're planted down deep enough, right? So that they don't get dug up. That'll be pretty though. So two or four really sable minor, sable minor, which are the scrub palms. There's two larger ones back over here, which are difficult to see, but they're over there. It'd be much more evident in the springtime and in the wintertime. And then all those fun green fronds from the ostrich ferns. Yeah, I think that'll be great. 
Gotta love that loose, rocky soil. It's the kind where you think it's going really smoothly with the auger, then all of a sudden it grabs onto it and just about rips your wrist off. A lot of gravel in here. Gonna have to use my hands to get some of that out, and that's all right. Look at that. So much sand. Can we even see this? Light. Ah, needs some clouds. Here are those mountain hoods. Can't see my screen. Hopefully you can see what's in my hands here. Nice big bulbs. Flat end down, pointy end up. That was easy. Mount hoods in the back, those ones with the really big white flowers on them, and then just in front of those, I put the pink parasol daffodils, which will stay just a smidge shorter. I think that'll look nice. I'm going to enjoy having that little, little pop of spring color there. And I know I've already said this, but again, remember that like all this stuff in the background, all those plants in the springtime, really none of that's there. Here's a little image of what the area tends to look like until like mid to late May. See, pretty open, lots of space for some color. I did come back in here and uh, use a hand trowel and dug the holes out just a smidge deeper. The auger just couldn't quite get far enough down. There's a lot of gravel in here and it was just kind of turning it up. It wasn't really going down. Needed it to go down further. Want the bulbs to be planted at the proper depth so that they're nice and sturdy and stable when they come up the next year. There will also be like maybe an inch and a half to two inches of mulch in this area, there'll be, a, like, the further back you go, there'll be more mulch because there's a big mound of mulch that has to go over there on top of those gingers, but not quite as much on the front. You get it. The, the mulch will help with the support and stability, but it needs to be there as those bulbs come up. It shouldn't be placed there afterwards. Right? You don't want to pile a bunch of mulch up around the fresh green growth that's being exposed to the air. Not in heavy, heavy, heavy quantities anyway, so I want to make sure that there's at least an inch and a half to two inches of mulch in that spot when it's time for them to come up. So that should be fairly easy to remember to do because I usually am out here doing mulching and stuff in the springtime. <laughs> so now I have this big bag, 70 bulbs here, the ones that the three months of mixed daffodils. The only problem I have with this assortment is that they aren't like divided up. They aren't labeled. I don't really know what's in here at all. I have no idea. The issue there is that even though this is fantastic because it says there's a mixture of many types of daffodils ensuring three months of bloom and it says they'll go very early to late spring as far as the flowering is concerned. That's fantastic. That's what I wanted. But since they aren't labeled as to which ones bloom when in order to have the effect of lots and lots of blooms going for a long time then they kind of all have to be planted in the same spot. So that's not really ideal with what I had planned out for these, but that's okay. I know 70 bulbs sounds like a lot, but it really isn't, like, at all. <laughs> People plant many, many, many more bulbs than this. So <laughs> what I'm going to do here is probably going to seem sort of weird, but since I actually do want to know which ones bloom when so that I can place them out properly, I'm going to put them in this hole here that I already have dug. So that's convenient. I need to open it up some more. But this is where the Alexander palm goes, the great big palm tree that sits out here for the warmer part of the year. I figure I'd just drop them all in this hole and then as they come up, pull them up and go ahead and label them and put them where I actually want them to go. What I had wanted to do is plant them up along my hill and have them naturalized up there, but I wanted there to be somewhat of a pattern. Dig this out some because that has filled in. This needed to be done anyways. Needed to get in here and clean this out, but I would normally do that in the spring right before that palm tree gets delivered. That's probably a good six inch there. Also, sorry, I don't have shoes on. I just washed all my shoes and I didn't want to get them dirty because I only have like two planting projects left. It just, I didn't want to do it. Anyway, got my kneeling pad and I'm just going to start filling this up. I know this probably seems kind of dumb, but <laughs> That's a lot of bulbs in one spot. 
So typically, especially with daffodils, I would never want them this close together, but since the plan here is to lift them as they start to emerge, I'm not concerned about that. I'll lift them and sort them out in the springtime as to what came up when, and then I'll have a better idea of how to get organized with these. I don't know why I just assumed that they would come like in separate bags as to when they bloomed. I didn't know they were just gonna come in one giant mess together, but this is all right, this still works. So there are some types of bulbs that I will plant this close together, even if you're not supposed to, like tulips. I think they always look better when they're a little bit closer together than what's recommended, hyacinth, same thing. Daffodils are better at naturalizing. Where I live, they just tend to be more reliable in that regard. <laughs> I talked about how the tulips and some other things with the heat and cold and everything just being all over the place, sometimes it seems to maybe confuse the bulbs, perhaps, and don't always know what's going to happen with them. Now I just need to go ahead and get this on top. Fill that in heavily. I filled back in with just some leftover potting soil as opposed to using a garden soil. The reason that I did that is because, um, sorry, it's so distracting having the puppy around. I only did that because potting mixes tend to be more light and fluffy. And when I come in here and I'm pulling them up, as I'm getting them organized in the springtime, uh, if they're filled back in with a heavy garden soil or even this more clay-like mix that I pulled out of there, then it could damage any roots that the bulbs have developed. Usually the growth will come up and there's barely any root on the bulb at that point, but just to be safe, I figured I would stick with something that's light and fluffy. This will do the trick just fine. Get some of that mulch spread around on here. And that's that, easy. I was gonna say, oh, that's gonna look so pretty there, but that doesn't matter, because I need to lift those out. Those can't really stay in that spot anyways. So this is really more just about getting them through the winter. I don't really like to store the bulbs in pots during the winter time because of everything I mentioned before about the temperatures going up and down and up and down. It never really goes very well for me. So that's all that. That's why I like daffodils, because of their reliability. They tend to last a lot longer as far as, you know, like tulips. You have the Darwins and some of the varieties that tend to be a little bit more sturdy and more reliable for returning, but I just, I'm not, uh, tulip. I could go on a rant about tulips. They're beautiful, but it's a lot of work for like a week and a half of blooms. I, I don't, it's not necessarily for me. Lived in a climate where I knew that they would just do wonderfully in the springtime and you'd get that show, you'd get the reward from planting them, that all the work you put in that pays off, then yeah, but... That's not really the case. Maybe it's just the shape of my yard, the orientation of the sun and everything with the pavement. I don't know, but just always hasn't worked out for me. Ultimately, what I had envisioned and wanted with the daffodils was to have them spread about on top of this hill from like probably right around back here, sort of behind this light, and then have them scattered sporadically over to where that bayberry is. I thought that would be a beautiful show during the springtime. But I do want that blend where they come up early and then you have the ones that come up mid-spring and then after. Still possible and doable. Just have to let them come up and get them organized. That's all. So my concern was that if I were to have broken that up into like six or seven different sections that, well, some would come up at different times. I would like each spot to have some that come up at all of the times. It's fine, I'm sure you get it. Next year, I will try to be better with my bulb order. So those are all just from Brex, which tend to be usually more inexpensive, but still an okay quality on the bulbs. I really like color blends, but I had trouble getting my order to process this year and I just said, forget it. Some websites are like that. Like I know, I think it's Brian Botanicals. When I check out on their website, if I'm using Chrome, it like just doesn't work. And usually I have to switch to either Safari or the Microsoft ones, like ones that I never use because I, I have a Microsoft computer. So I never use those search engines. Maybe I'll try that next year with color blends, but just wasn't working for me. Had a cart that was just full of daffodils. <laughs> so many beautiful daffodils. And uh, it, no, didn't happen. But that's all right. I'm happy with what I got. I'm looking forward to just little bits of spring color here and there next year. So right here, this is a hepticodium. Isn't it pretty? I have another one right here. Gorgeous plants, right? Well, it's a tree. It's a large shrub, small tree, and they're just twigs. That's okay. It's a perennial. They take time to grow. Someday these will be big, beautiful plants. For now, I'm just getting them in the ground because they will overwinter better in the ground than they will in a container. So I'm not even placing them necessarily where I want them. I just want them protected. This spot right here is where I drop a queen palm 
in the springtime it's there throughout the warm part of the year just like with the alexander palm down there so the hole was already dug i was going to have to fill in the hole regardless because i have these two sable miners those scrub palms on each side and for the winter survivability of those i think they would prefer to not have a big open space down in the ground where cold air can collect that's not far from their root zone right so this just made the most sense the reason I have that there instead of where I want it is because there's a crepe myrtle down here where I want it to go. Which I talked about during garden tours and in some other videos. So this is a Natchez crepe myrtle. It just doesn't get enough light here anymore. So it's always infested with something because it's not getting the proper conditions. And uh, it gets really big for this spot. Even though it tends to die down to the ground during the winter, unless we have a fairly mild winter, it'll still usually get 10 to 12 feet tall, which is the maximum height of that heptacodium. Those are the Temple of Bloom heptacodiums which uh, I actually, I think the video that came out prior to this one, I should have done a spotlight on those because I'm really excited about them. And so if you want like more in-depth details, it's just why I'm really excited about what just looks like some twigs, you can check that video out. But this is the vicinity that I want that plant in. And I have to move this crepe myrtle. I can't move it right now. I mean, I could, but it wouldn't be in the better interest of the plant to move it this time of year. It probably won't survive the winter. Whereas next year, as soon as it starts to, whereas next year, it got tongue tied there. As soon as it starts to, so, all right, apparently the pathway from my brain to my tongue just stopped working altogether. Once signs of growth start to show in the springtime, that is the ideal time to go ahead, lift it up and move it. This time of year, not a good idea, particularly just because of where I live. They're only marginally hardy here. So if I were to move it now, then it would potentially just die during the winter time and, uh, uh, this is going to have to go to somebody else's house because I don't have a spot in my backyard really that I think even gets the sun to keep this crepe myrtle happy anymore. So it's going to hang out there. And then the heptacodium is probably going to go right here. That or it's going to go right back, like kind of directly here, a few feet out from the fence. One of those two spots. But since I'm unsure, then I'm just plopping it down there because I already have a hole dug. So that's nice and easy. The main thing that I'll have to just keep in mind is to make sure that I actually do get it lifted and moved before it goes into like high drive active growth. You saw, hopefully you were able to see the roots on that. I loosen them up lightly. During the winter time, roots will still do some moving and some growing. It's not likely to be much, but the main thing is that I'm going to want to lift this out before those roots have started to move out from that root ball too terribly much. That way I can avoid any setbacks. So it wouldn't likely be much of a setback anyways because it's going to be pretty much the same as just planting it from a pot when I do this next year. But the reason that I wanted this in the ground instead of just keeping it in its container all winter is because if it's in the ground, then it's going to have more access to moisture, even though those roots haven't spread out. There's less water loss in the ground during the winter than there is in a pot. There's air moving around this. It's up from the ground, it's exposed, so temperature swings and all those things affect them much more quickly. Don't really have to worry about that in the ground, so it just seems smarter to give it that protection that it needs during the winter time. That way, just provide the best odds of the plant getting through the winter, nice and happy. The smaller the caliper on these stems, then the higher risk the plant is at of desiccation during the winter time and having wind burn and damage and just being affected from the freeze and thaws and freeze and thaws. Whenever that happens, things expand and contract, expand and contract. And with softwood plants, that can lead to damage inside those stems. So uh, this way, there's more access to water, sting, hydrate it longer. I won't have to make sure to come outside with a watering can and water them all winter long, you know, every couple of weeks or so. Overwintering them in the ground is just a heck of a lot easier, even if it's not where I necessarily want to keep the plant for the rest of its life. I think it's best to just put it there to get it through till next year. And I'm actually not all that opposed to keeping the Heptacodium myconoides, this Temple of Bloom, in this spot, because they only get 10 feet tall. So that would be pretty much the right size for this location. They flower later in the season, similar to a crepe myrtle. All the things I talked about in the video prior to this video about them. I just think it would look beautiful here, but I think that the space is a little bit tight for it. Don't, wouldn't you agree? Although most of the growth on it is going to be up here where there is a big gap, but it's also gonna be directly in front of the window, like probably forever, right? It's not like there are some crepe myrtles that will easily get way over 10 feet tall. And then you would have some open space towards the lower portion of that window and then some foliage up top. Ideally would want something that peaks up just below the window so you can just see the tops of the flowers. So basically anything that goes in this spot, I would like to be able to see through it somewhat. And I think that instead of seeing through it, it would just be like a perfect shade <laughs> to the window. You wouldn't really be able to see anything through the window except for leaves, which would be pretty, pretty, um, excuse you. Hey, Turbo, 
yeah. See, he knows. He's smart. I don't even have to tell him to get out anymore. He's just like, oh yeah, I'm not supposed to do that. So I do think that that would be a beautiful spot for the heptacodium. I just, eh, I think it'd be too tight and it would block that window. However, over here, for a very long time, I have been debating if I wanted to plant something in place of the magnolia that used to be over here. So like right where I planted all those daffodil bulbs, that would be a pretty good spot for one of these heptacodiums. Only get 10 feet tall, they have that beautiful open shape to them. And they fulfill like one of my main wants, which is to be able to look out this window here and have something that has lots of flowers on it that has lots of pollinators all over it. Pollinators love the heptacodiums. But I'm also really attached to being able to put the Alexander palm there because that is, it's just beautiful having that palm tree in that spot. And you know, eventually that palm tree is going to outgrow the greenhouse. And when that happens, you have different options. Usually you sell it back to them and then they sell it to like a shopping mall or something like that. But so it has hit a height where they tend to kind of pause out on their growth. So I could still have that for several more years. I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. Just saying that I do think that this would be a beautiful spot for one of those if I were to put one on the ground permanently. Ultimately, what I'm saying is I would very much like to have one of those heptacodiums in this vicinity over here and then another one over here. And then if I could have a third down there, that would be great <laughs> down there, right there where we just were. But again, I think that spot's too tight. And that extra one that I have down there, well, it's not an extra. That's going in the front. You're going to have a spot where that's just going to look beautiful. I'm sorry, I'm not going to show that. I don't show the front of my house just for safety reasons, right? It's not the smartest thing to do on the internet to be like, hey, look where I live. So I was only able to get two of those heptacodiums. So basically one's going to go right over here for right now, next spring when the crepe myrtles are gone, and then the other one's going in the front yard. If I can get another, then I think that right over there, I think that would be Beautiful, although I would kind of like to have something evergreen there too. So, I don't know, gotta think on that. Because the, my other option was like a Bracken's Brown Beauty Magnolia. That would be so pretty right here. But the Heptacodium takes up less space. And they still look kind of nice in part sun. They should get full sun, but in part sun they still like look okay. So uh, the only reason I, I threw the word and in there, because I was like, well, maybe I could do both. <laughs> but the Heptacodium where this planter is and let that grow up and oh, how pretty would that be? We're really deviating from other things right here but once that's actually full grown having the white flowers up top with that pinkish red calyx that hangs out on them for the rest of the season with those orange flowers down here just like just below the ha huh. planting the garden is fun i love doing this but i'm not not gonna waste anybody else's time with that just thinking and dreaming out loud here oh and no i didn't use any starter fertilizers any bulb tones anything like that because well, it's just, it, i don't fully understand why i would do that this time of year the whole point of the biotone starter is to get the mycorrhizae down around those roots and uh, since i'm going to be moving the plant then it just doesn't it doesn't really make sense this is just it's holding place until springtime and the bulb tone can be worked into the top of the soil and watered in in the springtime as they come up so that's probably what I'll do because I, I don't have any bulb tone or any type of bulb fertilizer period right now. And well, not with the bulb fertilizers, I usually do those right after they're done blooming. So I suppose it could put it down like is like the very moment that you start to see them emerge. As long as the ground's warm enough, there's no reason you couldn't work some of that in or use a starter fertilizer. But I think bulb tone plus a little starter fertilizer and then doing it again. Whatever, you get it. Okay, I need to take this to the front yard, get it planted, and then I have some updates to give. Electrician finally came. Talked about that in last week's video and prior videos. So I had some projects I wanted them to get done, some things that were broken. Have electricity again out here. Very exciting and got some information about doing a nice big heater in the grow space. So I'm gonna do this and then we'll cut back to all that. What are you sniffing? What's that smell? Does it smell like fall? Smells like weather. He's so big. The dog is huge. Can't even imagine how big he'll be in six months, seven months when he's a year old. But before I dig into the updates with the electricity, there's not that much to say with that anyways. I did want to mention, uh, uh, I did some editing on this video between the last clip and this clip. I went to get the pictures to put up for the daffodils. People know what I'm talking about uh, and saw the prices. Right now, Brex is claiming to have all these things definitely do not chew on that okay good boy they have the little slashes through all their prices saying that things are heavily marked down and i was looking at the regular prices and i was like um yeah the, at no point did i spend 129.99 on a bag of bulbs not for 70 bulbs from brex absolutely not maybe it was like that when i bought that maybe there's one of those websites where they always have the slashes through things so you always think things are on sale i just want to make sure y'all knew that i did not spend that kind of, in fact, I have my, heck, I have my 
invoice right here. So the packs of five bulbs were $14.99. They were not $32.99 according to the website. The Beauregard Alliums were $14.99 a piece. They were not $32.99 a piece. I can't imagine they were ever that price considering I placed my order in July or August, something like that. I, I don't know. So that was that update there. Right now they're claiming everything's on sale, this heavy markdown, but the prices looked to me to be the same price as they were back in the prime season when I ordered them. That's what's going on there. Not trying to trash talk anybody, because like I said, I don't know if that's how they had things labeled to begin with, but it's definitely not what I paid for any of those things. You wanna come inside? Turbo, come on baby, you can't take the stick. Good boy, he's learning so quickly. Like a month ago, if anything he was chewing on outside, like, can I take it inside? No, no you cannot baby. Oh, there you go, good boy. Okay. Grow space update. Just like last week, nothing's changed out here. I have some plants a little bit ticked off from being moved inside, but everything is still fairly sprawled out because I was waiting for the electrician to come out to tell me whether or not they could put a heater up over there on the wall, like an actual proper 220 volt or 240, I'll talk about that in a minute. A high power heater that would heat the space more efficiently than all the space heaters on the ground. I don't want like to call the space heaters. I'm over it. I don't want to use those anymore. Though so, technically the garage heaters, which would, it would have to go right where that fan is, probably from the ceiling. I don't know. I'm going to let the electrician worry about that part. It is a space heater, but it would be one that's not hooked to an extension cord. It would be run to its own box and its own line for safety reasons, which would take a lot of pressure off the circuit breaker for all the grow lights. So that wouldn't be tripping all of the time. Anyways, the electrician came this morning and it, the one I, I had come out apparently isn't one that's well versed in garage heaters. So he knew enough of the basics. He was like, yeah, here's what I'll do. I'll have to run a line in from the street, put a box in next to your box to run up to a 220 volt outlet to put the heater on. And then I either need to pick out the heater or he needs to pick out the heater. He said that there is no such thing as a 240 volt heater, which I get, I don't, I don't know. This is why I'm hiring a professional. I just know that when I was looking at garage heaters, a lot of them said 240 V. Does that V not mean volt? I would think that it does, right? I don't know, but that would probably be an important thing to figure out beforehand. So I have to do a little bit of research and then hopefully in the next few weeks, he'll be able to come out, run the line and do the heater it's doable. So I'm very excited. But because of that, I'm not doing anything out here yet. I wish I was because I'm actually like would like to start getting filming and some things going out here. But there's just no reason to when I'm going to have to clear out a bunch of space that they can get in here and bust up the wall and run a line and all that stuff. So I'm, it's exciting news, I think. <laughs> like I think I think it's exciting because I'm not positive with the confusion going on with the 240 volt versus 220 volt stuff. Right, it's a little bit confusing. That's why we hire professionals, right? To just figure those things out. That's electricity over my head. Dangerous stuff if you don't know what you're doing, especially with that type of voltage. So ah, I'm gonna do some digging and some research. I My hopes were to have someone come out who just like knew what they were doing. I mean, he knows what he's doing, but as far as like the garage heaters, because there were several companies I contacted where it was like something that they did. They knew about it and they would just come out and install it and handle everything. This one, apparently that's not a thing that he does very often, but he's qualified to do it and make sure everything's done safely and um, up to code and whatnot. I do need to do some watering, like the croton, so thirsty. What's going on out here with all of the plants? I do have some fun trays coming in the mail that I'm going to be using on the racks over here. I'll be able to put more plants on them and I guess, well, you'll see that when those come. Gonna be a little while, probably a week or so. <laughs> Can you move? <laughs> Excuse me, Durbo, I can't get in. Can you move, baby? Turbo. Turbo. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good doorstep, don't you? Oh. And then in other exciting news, look at these. Yeah, we've officially deviated from anything being about plants. That part of the video is over. Look at that. Oh, they're so big. This is a nice, sexy washers and dryers. The color is sapphire blue. I didn't care about the color. It was what was available the fastest. So that's what ended up getting here. They're so, look at how big. They're so big. Gonna be able to put all the king size comforters and all those things in there. There's so much room for activities inside of there. So nice being able to do laundry. I was able to do laundry before, but it was like a full day event, sometimes more than that, just to get one load done because they weren't working properly. And when they went to the spin cycle, it shook the entire house, had them balanced and all that stuff, and it's still like, not the entire house, but you could feel it upstairs in most of the bedrooms and downstairs. It was very loud. I can use fabric softener again. The other 
washer and dryer for like the last four years, the, this part up here where the stuff goes didn't work. You'd pour it in and it would just stay there. Or sometimes it would just put, like somehow leak out through here and pour out the bottom and had repair people come out and they never were able to quite get it fixed. So that's, that's fun. And do you see that? One step wash and dry? What? Fancy, unnecessary, probably I just ran them to the wall. That's the, these do stick out further than the other ones because they're bigger. I don't care about them really using the space for anything other than doing laundry anyways. But what that does is you can put a load in here, a small load, and uh, it'll wash it and dry it. But it takes like eight hours. So that's more of those like gonna be gone all day and toss a load in and then hit that button. And hopefully by the time you come home, it's dried. So you don't have to be there to swap them. It's neat, but honestly a function I will probably never use. But look at this, look at this. It makes fun clicky sounds. You hear that? Oh, it sounds so fancy. If you ready. Right, it's my favorite feature. Look at that. You can see inside of it. How cool is that? Unnecessary. Not something anybody needs. Old washer and dryer had a light, but it didn't work while it was actually running. Look at that. How fun. So much fun. Isn't that cool? I know there's a lot of reflections and things, but believe me, if you were here in person, so much fun. I actually, I should turn that, hit the pause on that because there's not even a load in there. It's kind of wasteful. Come on, Turbo. Come on. Come on, baby. Good boy, Turbo. Like yesterday, it was what, four o'clock in the afternoon. I was like, oh, I need to do this load of towels and it would be nice to do some sheets. I wanted to go to sleep on fresh sheets that night. Normally in the past, what I've been doing the past couple of years is, well, just realizing that that's not an option because <laughs> you have to get up to start your laundry at like 7 a.m. if you want it to be done by the time you go to bed. So, uh, not anymore. Just throw the clothes in there and then in like, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes, ready to go in the dryer. So nice. That depends on the cycle, right? I know that this is probably not that fascinating or exciting to anybody else, but I am absolutely loving it. I have so much fun having a washer and dryer that works. And dark outside, I'm gonna turn the lights on. It's only like one o'clock in the afternoon, but clouds are finally rolling in. Oh, the main reason the electrician was here, if you don't know what's been going on, there hasn't been power to like this half of the yard for a few months now. And that turns out, it was as I expected, there were some bad GFCIs and just there were some pipes in the ground where the electric was run that had just rusted out over the years. So the guy went ahead and fixed that so that there's at least power right now and then he's gonna come back out next week and run some new lines and some new pipes and make it all nice and safe again. So that's nice, there's lights outside again. And the dishwasher for a while wasn't working. Then they came out and fixed it. Worked for two weeks, then it stopped working. Then they came out and fixed it. Worked for a couple weeks and stopped working. Uh, and then they came back out again and uh, realized that it was an electrical problem and maybe not a them problem. I think it was a combination of both. But for a little while, this only worked if the garbage disposal was running. And, you know, you can't run the garbage disposal for the amount of time. You can only, you know, turn those on and off for short spans. I realized until I put the camera on this thing how many spots there were on that stainless. And then as of two days ago, it's working fine. So he doesn't know what the problem is. It's like whenever I take my car to get fixed, Whatever was wrong is never wrong when it's there, so that's what's going on there. I don't really care. Doing dishes by hand has not been a big deal. Not a big deal at all. So, I mean, it'd be nice if it was more reliable. But, but right now, it's working, so that's not the end of the world. I just am so excited to be able to do laundry. There are some laundromats around, and I did that a few times when I was more pressed on time, but it's nice when you have the hookups and everything, and you have the space for the machines to actually have the... It's such a big deal. Like, that's such a big purchase. So I'm so excited about it. I know it's nothing to do with the plants, but I talked about it last week. So there's the update. That's the laundry room. That's why I'm looking at that door. And now we're all up to date. Everything's been updated. Bulbs are in the ground. I don't know if I'll be ordering from Brex again next year or not, but I know now that if I order a blend that for every space where I want that blend, I need to order the bulbs. So instead of ordering the one bag of 70 and planning on spreading it out some, would have been smarter to have ordered one, two, three, like four of them so that they would all be together and that way they would have that evenness. That would work out better. Hey, pumpkin. You're such a cute pumpkin. You're so sweet. Can I have a kiss? Thanks, sweetie. You're such a sweetheart pumpkin. All right. <laughs> That's going to do it. Uh, hopefully next week the new trays will be in for the grow space and can do some things with the plants. I was really expecting her to bop him on the nose. These two, 
they've gotten, I don't know if I'd say they're tight, but she seems to really enjoy his company. But she's still a cat, so she only enjoys his company when she wants his company. So, hope everybody's doing well. What's going on in your gardens? Things still going on outside? I'm sorry, fish. I didn't mean to scare you. Grounds are not frozen. There's still time to get the spring bulbs put in the ground and... But really all the perennials can still go on the ground too, the woody shrubs at least. Pretty sure that I am officially done getting plants in the ground for the year. There might be like a couple sedums or something out there that I might stick in the ground, but nothing too pressing. You really need to go out again? Yeah, that tiny little puppy bladder keeps walking over the door and whining. Gotta respect it. Those are the rules. It's how he's gonna learn. There you go, baby. You didn't sit. He doesn't sit when I have the camera in my hands. Well, go on, go potty, go to the grass. It's his nap time. That's when he starts to get weird. Oh, uh, just because I know people will ask, he has been great about not going on the pool cover. He stepped over to it once, put his paw on it, said no. He stepped off and then he stepped on it again. And I said, no, get out of there because he knows what that means. It's what you say when he goes in the garden. And he hasn't tried since. Sometimes he'll walk up to the edge and give it a sniff. He can probably smell the water. He seemed pretty disappointed when it got covered up. This dog loves the pool. So that was a relief because you don't really want them running across the pool covers. It's a safety cover. It has springs on it. So in theory, it should be fine. I know Tucker, I spent a lot of time working with him. He would still zoom across that thing. I shouldn't have been. It always had my heart pounding, but he just never picked up on that one. Toby, he never really had any interest of in going across there. Still doesn't, pretty much ignores it. And Turbo, he seems to be staying away. The real challenge is going to be when there's snow and you can't see the pool cover. Though usually when it snows, it kind of caves in and you can tell where the pool is. So that'll just be another thing to have to teach him when the time comes, but he's pretty good. So far, if you tell him not to do something, he stops doing it. Very good impulse control for a five month old puppy. Just for a Labrador. Okay, you didn't do, you didn't go potty. So it's time to go inside, come on. Oh, and the sip, y'all didn't get to see these all season. And I didn't even mention that when I was pulling the stuff up and planting the bulbs. The, the Sable Miners scrub palms were planted last or 2019 2020 <laughs> spring of 2020 and they were just tiny little things and here's the grown they did they were hidden by the sun and patience all year so there's the update with those let me do some more talking about the scrub palms as the annuals and tropicals and the things that need to die down start to go away because we'll be able to see them better and give them more of a spotlight all right turbo come on come on baby yeah no now we're really going in i think that was kind of confusing for him did you show up for a cookie party? Of course you did. She knows. You went outside, means you're gonna get a cookie. There you go, good boy. You want it? You want it? There you go. Enjoy your cookies. All right, hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day and a great life and everything's just going beautifully for you. Thanks for hanging out. This may have been a longer video. I'm not entirely certain. I still have a lot of cutting to do. Longer and very chatty video. Never know what to do when it comes to planting the bulbs because it's like, there's just, there's not much to see there. But since they'll be here in the spring, wanted to make sure to cover them so that we know like where they came from. And it's a good reference for me to look back because sometimes, you know, you plant bulbs and you forget what's what and what's where. So I have that for my records too. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.